designers of the Wellington was Barnes Wallace, who had a reputation for all sorts of things, which started with airships, and it was him that uh, that uh, introduced the geogenic structure. And we'll just try a video. Let's see how we go. We won't look at all of it, but it'll give you a uh, an idea. So you've got that. But we haven't got that. problems always push the wrong button we're starting again sorry instead of the escape button I push the off button <laughs> So the theme that I had while we reverted is that life for bomber command people, particularly in operations, was noisy, it was cold, and it was dark, and it was dangerous. Noisy because nobody, they had, while they had earmuffs to, uh, as a headset, they, um, the aeroplanes themselves, as I said, no insulation and uh, pretty basic. It was cold, and uh, if you remember from from your aviation, for those that are from aviation, every 1,000 feet in altitude, you lose two degrees in temperature. So at 10,000 feet, you're 20 degrees below what you are on the ground. And uh, that will be significant in the bit that we'll see shortly. Going to have to, I'm going to carry on without the, uh, the uh, bits that go with it, I think. We might try it with that one. See if we get this one. What does this strange looking right. tomato have to do with arthritis? Right. Everything, according to a new scientific discovery. Right, that was the story about uh, making the Wellington bombers and essentially uh, Vickers had this plan where the aeroplane could be made in, in a day. That was the whole factory contributing. The, uh, the story called uh, 
workers' weekends actually was uh, showed that uh, an aeroplane could be assembled in 24 hours and that set their target of 30 hours and I think they achieved it in 24 hours and 40 minutes. So that was from nothing on the jigs. The, all the pieces came prefabricated at sections of these geodetic structures. The aeroplane was flew away with with armament and uh, 24 hours later. So just a little bit about Bomber Command. And Wellington's and Bomber Command didn't have a good start in, the, in 1939. 22, 12 out of 22 were shot down at a daylight raid. And um, the whole idea of uh, Bomber Command was to deal with, the, uh, after the occupation of Europe and the Battle of Britain, Bomber Command was the only force available to hit back at what was a fortress without a roof. The name of a very good study of, uh, of the Strategic Air Command. The aeroplanes were basic. This was Whitley bombers, Hamdens, Blenheims, and Wellingtons were what the Air Force, what the Air Force then had available, and was what they uh, turned their attention to uh, attacking the Germans in their homeland and in their occupy in their the countries that they occupied. <coughs> the British had already developed with this the home chain uh, radar system integrated into the fighter command control systems. The German radar was better, but they didn't have or they hadn't seen the need for an air defence. They were con they were all conquering and didn't need it. Bomber Command itself was headed by uh, an Air Marshal, uh, Sir Richard Pearce, and uh, his headquarters was in High Wickham, RAF High Wickham. I think it's in Berkshire, is that right? Something more. Hampshire. 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 Right. Oxford, way. And uh, so, uh, as you see, Bomber Command in the middle along with Coastal Command, Fighter Command, Training Command and then a series of groups and these are some of them and underneath that was Fatwell and 75 Squadron. So I'm not going to start doing this again because we'll lose the world and we'll carry on. It was a movie called Target for Tonight and it was unusual in that the people in command were actually featured as uh, personnel in the movie. It won a, uh, some awards for its, uh, for its excellence and included operations of, Sydney, of uh, Wellington bombers as well. These, this is essentially uh, the, well, the uh, Royal Air Force bombers on the left, Wellington's Stirlings, the first four, four engine uh, bombers, British made, and then uh, Handley Page, Hamptons and Halifaxes, another four engine aeroplane. So uh, opposing them was Messerschmitt 110s. <coughs> so in 1941, Bomber Command grew in strength, but navigation over blanked out, blacked out Europe was still a major problem. Setbacks in the Battle of the Atlantic meant a major effort was needed against German warships and U-boats. German night fighters and anti-aircraft guns were becoming more effective. Heavy losses called morale. Two engine bombers formed the bulk of Bomber Command, Wellington's and Hamptons, and then as I said, uh, some of the four engine ones uh, appeared. A 
opposing these light and medium bombers was the 110, as I mentioned, and it was a particularly dangerous foe, as and with the reputation of being heavily armed with cannons and uh, machine guns. The unseen nemesis was the Cam Huber line. Essentially, it was comprised of an air, air defence series of grids across northern Europe. This image was acquired by a Belgian agent, and you can see the these were called uh, Himmelpecks, and they are actually a 32-kilometre uh, square, and of course the bomb was quite ignorant of this line, uh, had to run the gauntlet. They were running the gauntlet actually at that stage um, with against searchlights, <coughs> manually operated searchlights. They became radar operated later, but initially uh, the idea was you used the searchlights to show the pilots of these uh, 110s where the enemy was, and um, then they went and did their business. The Cam Hoover line was defeated by directing bombers and streams to def defeat the defensive system. But essentially, this was the start of a cat and mouse game of electronic warfare, which followed uh, through the rest of the war. As the book talks about, uh, Dr. R. V. Jones, a scientist, was became the British expert uh, who identified German electronic systems and set about countering them. <coughs> Every uh, organisation's got leadership, and so on the British side, uh, Charles Portal led the Royal Air Force. And in New Zealand, another Royal Air Force officer, uh, Hugh Saunders, led the RNZAF. In the UK, the Air Council ruled. In New Zealand, the Air Board ruled. Alongside them, there was uh, the Air Ministry, actually had a New Zealand liaison officer assigned to it, and a very popular person who uh, was always willing and able and available was uh, to visit troops and, or, and units in the UK was Mr. Bill Jordan, who was the New Zealand High Commissioner, and felt well, was a regular place that he visited. <coughs> One of the biggest changes happened uh, in the organisation of the Royal Air Force and the Air Ministry was that at a stroke, as soon as uh, Winston Churchill became Prime Minister, the entire aircraft production component of the Air Ministry was devolved to the Ministry of Aircraft Production. This was a huge move, but it wasn't unparalleled in that Winston Churchill had become the Minister of Munitions in World War I, so knew what had to be done. What you might not realise is that aircraft production in the UK was massive and it consumed aircraft production and support, not just in the UK, but also in the United States, as we'll see in the next slide, uh, consumed more than 60% of the war economy of the UK. We were building ships, they were building aeroplanes. And if you, you'd have to be spending money if you're gonna open a new airfield every three days. <coughs> In the uh, United States, the uh, British government had established the Direct Purchasing Commission, and the numbers there, I won't repeat them, are staggering. Uh, was at $12 billion of uh, orders, and that was 1940, and they expected to deliver 500 aeroplanes a month uh, by 1941. At that stage, interestingly enough, the, uh, the Americans were neutral, and so uh, aeroplanes could only be, uh, be delivered unarmed. And uh, they were taken to the, uh, the Canadian borders and border and pushed across because the Americans were in late to help them. Uh, as soon as the Land Lease um, Act was signed in March 1941, uh, that all changed. And most importantly, 
uh, Britain went on, uh, was able to purchase war materials on credit, which was not the case prior to that. And uh, New Zealand was party to uh, sending gold shipments to uh, meet the, the cash payments that were required for these aircraft acquisitions. And the Niagara the ship that was lost in New Zealand uh, to a mine uh, had gold that was destined to, uh, was a Bank of England payment to the United States that didn't quite make it. So there's just a, a number of the uh, aeroplanes that went into bombers, that went into bomber command service from the United States. This is 75 Squadron at uh, Fatwell, the, um, and just running around the um, running around was the, the uh, slide starting with the air traffic control, which is obviously which is self-evident. Uh, the um, a walk down, which was a public relations exercise done uh, before Jimmy Ward arrived. Picture at the right top is uh, High Commissioner uh, Bill Jordan meeting the troops, and. Um, the bottom is uh, Jimmy Ward's and a, uh, a celebration lunch uh, with the entire squadron. In the middle, at the bottom, is a uh, what everybody did every day, and this was briefing and debriefing. And uh, in this picture, this picture was owned by a contemporary of Bill of uh, Jimmy Ward, who lives in Wanganui, and was at the book launch. And then at the left, aeroplanes out in the field, and uh, obviously the ground crew uh, got a bit of sunlight and uh, enjoying the day. This is the Wellington cockpit for the pilots among us, and uh, it is actually a single place cockpit with um, one set of controls. Single, uh, a twin set of controls was available for the training version, but that only uh, was available with a special set of modifications that um, put in the seat, put in uh, pedals and um, another control column. So pilot seat on the left and uh, a dicky seat on the right where the second pilot would sit for takeoffs and landings. What is unusual is that uh, that there is the is the entry door. And it's also the uh, bench, the squab for the bomb aimer to uh, uh, lie on. So it's all pretty close and it's not that much room. I like the picture on the left. It is a real picture. The, uh, apparently it was staged from 149 Squadron and uh, it just shows uh, the gear that they wore. And I told you about the theme that it was cold and uh, the pilot is mittens and uh, pretty good gloves and a may west over the top of everything and then as well as that uh, there would be they would have uh, parachutes as well i think the, the the captain had a seat parachute and the everybody else had uh, chest parachutes So Wellington in service, this picture on the left hand side to me is, this is Jimmy Ward's world. This is the pilot in command sitting in the, in the cockpit and discusses plans with his observer, um, flashing at the, uh, the map where they're going. Across the top, uh, an aeroplane oddly in, in a hangar being serviced, and then a very poignant picture, and that will come on to the relevance of shortly is the, um, the astro hatch. And if you can see, here's an observer with his head in the astro hatch, which is the dome, and there's a tray across the, across the middle, and he's, got a, he's standing in the middle of that. And uh, so it did the sextant shots out the astro dome, and uh, this was a freehand uh, sextant. Back down to look in the um, 
the rear of the fuselage, and this is a crewman lowering, about to release a, uh, uh, a camera flare. Across the hurdle, the um, bomb bay beams, the bomb base, uh, long and narrow, and quite well suited for uh, torpedoes, which was one of the variations. The operations room of the stations was the centre of management and control of what happened on a daily basis or whenever there was going to be operations. This is a uh, this is the picture of and they took one of they took pictures of this whenever it changed it, so they had evidence of what was there wasn't any computers of course and so you had the um, the aircraft, the, um, the code of the aeroplane, and I'll tell you about that in the next slide, who the captain was, what the takeoff time was, and the um, return time. Other aeroplane, other airfields in the vicinity were also um, noted with the, um, the visibility of those airfields. So this actually constituted what was called, a, called an order of battle. So at Fatwell there was 75 New Zealand squadron and 57 squadron RAF. So both had the same number of, air, of aircraft and on, in this picture on the 16th and 17th of June 1941 was uh, 31 aeroplanes, 16 for 75 and 15 for 57 squadron. I was telling you about the uh, everything had a, that uh, aeroplanes had codes. So an aeroplane had a uh, a letter code, which is the the single letter, and then it had a double letter. So AA was unique to 75 New Zealand Squadron. It had been inherited from 75 Squadron Royal Air Force and um, all the aeroplanes in that squadron always carried the AA code. Individual aeroplanes were, were assigned an individual letter code and uh, this was not just for identification in the daytime but uh, they used Morse code with a signal light at the front of the aeroplane to indicate to the ground crew uh, which aeroplane was which. So the point was that everybody had to know Morse code, ground crew as well. We're now getting at the penultimate time for uh, this lecture which is about Jimmy Ward and his um, feet on what was called the Munster Raid on the 6th and 7th of July 1941. Essentially the aeroplane um, was with a, a number of other aircraft sent to attack the rail yards at a city called Munster and uh, while we haven't got the NAV maps for the for the uh, for this particular raid I've drawn in one that uh, isn't in the book that might have been so essentially heading north across the Atlant across the uh, English Channel into Germany and uh, back via what's called the inland sea or the Zyder sea in, uh, in the Nether Netherlands or Holland and it was here that a um, EB-110 <coughs> attacked uh, the aircraft and gave rise to a, a fire that uh, Jimmy Ward was attempted to deal with. Essentially, the, uh, once the fire had uh, Jimmy Ward's story and the book talks about uh, Jimmy was actually the only person on the crew 
that didn't have a job. He was, he was required to look out, but uh, he was there as a standby pilot in case the, uh, the captain was injured. And uh, he was there to learn the ropes before he became a pilot in his own right. Part of the attack included the, uh, if we go forward a slide, resulted in damage to the aeroplane. In the nose, uh, it suddenly got really drafty. With the skin, I talked about the, uh, the canvas covering, the, not the canvas, the, the uh, Irish linen uh, was peeled back to expose the, um, the geodetic structure. And on the wing, we actually got a different story. So we go back to the slide we just came from. And uh, this is a depiction of, uh, of the action that uh, Jimmy Ward was involved with, where he actually climbed out onto the wing to deal with a fire that uh, was a fuel-fed fire. And uh, if, you, if you look closely at the picture, depicted in the, in the Astrodome is the navigator, and his name was Joe Lawton. Joe Lawton was, uh, went on to become the superintendent of navigation in New Zealand, but this time he was uh, he was the observer, a sergeant observer in, uh, in 75 Squadron. And this is a rope that Jimmy Ward tied around him, around his chest. He had a, he had a, um, a parachute on, and he took with him uh, the cockpit cover that he was going to use to put the fire out. Coming forward, on his way down, so he gets out the, the astro hatch, and the astro hatch was always designed as a hatch. It was an emergency hatch for getting out of the aeroplane um, if, uh, if, if it had a problem for those in the middle cabin. What he did was uh, the fabric was was weak enough for him to kick holes in the fabric so that I talked about uh, this being dangerous, this being noisy, this being cold, this being dark. But uh, the aeroplane was at this stage running at 90 knots, so over 100 miles an hour. Uh, so that's a hell of a gale to deal with. And I also said that the the temperature, and we actually looked at the mean temperature in uh, Rotterdam when they were too far off from it, which was 12 degrees. So take 20 degrees off that, you're sub-zero. Add to that the chill factor for 100 knots, 100 or 90 knots of wind. And before you even start uh, climbing anywhere, uh, Jimmy Ward was essentially putting his skill as a climber to, um, to uh, save the lives of those, all those on board. The thing about the, this particular fire was, fire was really a problem for the, um, for the Wellington, because this fabric, which was covered in paint, was uh, just waiting to burn. Fortunately, in this case, uh, Jimmy's efforts, uh, while it didn't put the fire out, it, it, uh, the fire never spread, and the, uh, it became, he was busy trying to uh, shove this uh, engine cover down into the wing, but uh, suddenly the wind got it, and uh, off it went, and the uh, rear gunner saw it flying by uh, off into the, uh, into the organ. 